Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, what I would like to do in this lecture is take our discussion from the previous lecture and push it a little bit further, but in a different direction. And I want to point it towards partial differential equations, right? So remember in the previous lecture, we looked at statistics. So the question is, what do these two things have to do with each other? Well, it turns out that that Gaussian function, the density of the standard normal distribution, plays a critical role in partial differential equations, and in particular, diffusion models. Now, the question is, what does this mean? And what is it that we're going to talk about today? Well, let's imagine that we have some concentration of particles that are released uh, at a single point in space then those particles move randomly throughout, we'll restrict ourselves to a one-dimensional medium. So they randomly move to the left and to the right and they spread throughout that medium through a process that's known as Brownian motion. Now the question is, how do we capture the statistical movement of these uh, particles? The way that we do this is through a diffusion equation. So diffusion just means spreading throughout space, this exact process that we're describing. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like C of X comma T to be the concentration, so the concentration of particles at point X in space and t in time, okay? So there is a, a sort of double process here, right? You have space and time dependence, right? So you're moving, you're spreading throughout space as time goes on, okay? So what I could do is I could maybe pause time and I could say at this point in time, at that point in space, what is the concentration uh, of these particles? Now we're gonna have this assumption that if I sum up the concentration of particles everywhere in space, this is always equal to one. What is this? This is a conservation law, but it means that you are accounting for all of the particles at every point in time. Nobody disappears, nobody randomly comes into existence. It means that if I look over all of space, everyone is accounted for, right? So I'm just normalizing this. This sort of means 100% of the particles are somewhere in space. Okay, so nothing funky going on, uh, you know, in the sort of physics realm here. All right, so it turns out that C satisfies a very particular equation called the diffusion equation. So diffusion equation. And this is a partial differential equation, all right? So it's, it's not a, it's a more complicated version of the differential equations we've already seen. It involves partial derivatives. So it tells us that the concentration, the derivative of that thing with respect to time is equal to some number d over two times the second partial derivative with respect to space. Now if you want to, you could derive this equation using Fick's law but I don't want to actually spend time doing that. I'd like to actually look at what this means from a modeling perspective, okay? So mathematically, once you get uh, better with, um, with partial differential equations, you'll be able to recognize this as uh, a very particular type of equation, typically referred to as a heat equation, because it it's, describes exactly the process of how heat spreads throughout, uh, say, a room. This tells us that we are changing in time, just like our dynamical systems. So it tells us that the way that the concentration changes in time is given by the second derivative. That second derivative is the diffusion terms. It tells us that things are spreading out across our system. Now, solving partial differential equations is not an easy task, right? This is something that's left up to at least an entire class on partial differential equations. So I don't want to go through that here. I'm going to give you a particular differential equation or particular solution to this PDE. And let's talk about it. Okay, I'm much more interested in the modeling here than the PDE for now. 
The solution to this thing, one of them, is 1 over the square root of 2 pi dt and then times e to the minus x squared over 2 dt. Okay, so you can see the D showing up. That is the diffusion rate. It's how quickly this thing is spreading. If D is super, super small, you can imagine there's some sort of friction preventing the molecules from spreading very quickly. Whereas if D is very, very large, it's almost slippery. Everybody moves really, really quickly. All right, so what happens? As T goes to zero, this thing concentrates around X equal to zero. That's the idea uh, behind this Brownian motion. I know that every particle starts at a single point in space and then they spread from there. How are they spreading? Well, this is my Gaussian curve. This is the density of the normal distribution. It's a bell curve. So maybe this is what it looks like for some value of time. If you look at this thing, if you plot it for increasing values of t, what happens? It spreads out this way and the peak comes down. Now you have this conservation here that the area underneath this thing is always equal to one. So if it's spreading out, if it's getting a little fatter, then it gets a little shorter as well, right? So it's, it's uh, wide and short as opposed to tall and skinny. It starts super, super tall and skinny and spreads out. That is the basic principle of Brownian motion. We know where everybody starts and then you sort of wander to the left and to the right. The longer you wait, the further you could get away. That's all that this spreading is telling you. We can actually go further with this and make that connection with the, uh, with the normal distribution more precise. So here's what I want to do. I want to suppose that over a small time interval, delta t greater than zero, okay, so some tiny little time interval, um, we're going to track a single particle, okay? A single particle either jumps left or right. It makes a small random movement, xi. Okay, so it takes either a step to the left or it takes a step to the uh, right. And the amount of that movement is, it can vary, right? It'll depend on some parameters of the system and the, the specific, specifics of the molecule. But the point is, Every one of these movements is independent. So the fact that I moved right uh, on the previous step does not affect whether or not I'll move right or left again. Okay, so I, I have this like sort of lack of memory. I completely forget what I did on the previous one. Well then, we can also assume that moving left and right have the same probability, which would tell you that the expected value here is zero. So on average, you sort of don't move. Right? You make the same amount of steps to the right as you do to the left in the aggregate. And let's also assume that we have some variance. Now the variance is going to tell me um, the, the length of the movements that I'm making to the left and the right. Now, why is this interesting? Well, the central limit theorem helps me out here a little bit. The central limit theorem tells me that this should approximately be true. Xn divided by square root, this is approximately the normal distribution. Uh, normal distribution. I'm just going to write it very informally just so that you see it. So this tells me that the if I sum up all of my movements, so I, I ask myself, where did I go after I took n steps? That's what this is going to be, this summation here. And then I divide off this standard deviation. This thing should be approximately a normal distribution. So let's call that thing Z. That's my random variable that will describe the normal distribution. Then what this really says is the sum of all of my movements, left and right, right? So if I take up the whole sum, the aggregate of how I moved, this should be another random variable that's given by sigma root n times the normal distribution z. Okay, 
Well, how does that help me? Well, let's take a look at something here. So first of all, if this thing is a normal distribution, then I have a probability that sigma root n z is less than or equal to x. Well, this thing is just the same as z is less than or equal to x over sigma root n, which since it's a normal distribution, then this thing is the same as the integral of minus infinity to x over sigma root n, one over the square root of two pi e to the minus x squared over two dx, which now I can rearrange this thing and it's going to be the integral, so if I use a, a change of variable here, maybe if I call this, say, up to y now, this would be 1 over square root of 2 sigma squared, uh, sorry, 2 pi sigma squared n e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma root n d, uh, sorry, this was y dy. Okay, so maybe you're thinking to yourself, Jason, uh, that doesn't help, right? What is that actually trying to tell me? Well, this is telling me the probability of my movements all in the aggregate. But I also told you that this describes the macroscopic probability distribution. So what you can probably see is that there is a close correspondence here between my um, my actual probability distribution and the probability distribution that shows up inside of this thing. In particular, we know that this gives us d is equal to uh, sigma squared over delta t, which gives us that n sigma squared is equal to dt. Okay, so what that tells me is that this n sigma squared term, that is the variance, n times the variance, so all of the sort of spreads, the lengths of the steps that I should be expecting to take, this is spreading at whatever this coefficient d is, multiplied by time going on. So what this tells me is that the normal distribution, or the normal density right here, is a solution to the uh, diffusion equation that represents the relative concentration of contaminants since this integral goes to one. So if I let y go to positive infinity. All right, so if I wanted to actually figure out maybe the, the exact concentration instead of the relative concentration, I would just multiply this thing by a constant in order to put a mass on top of this. Okay, so that tells us that there is a close correspondence between a deterministic partial differential equation and Brownian motion, a probabilistic process. Remember, we're trying to describe particles jumping back and forth. And we did it through two different methods. We did it by solving a partial differential equation to get a density. But we also saw that it comes from the central limit theorem that tells me that I get that all of these movements in the aggregate should be approximately a normal distribution that when I you know, put it together, the density function comes out to be the same density function that I'm seeing right here. All right, so how do we use this? How does this help us to describe something? Well, let's take an example, okay? So let's imagine that an accident at an industrial plant 10 kilometers upwind from a small town releases an airborne pollutant. Okay, one, after the, one hour after the release, a toxic cloud about 2,000 meters uh, long has, is headed towards the town at a wind speed of about three kilometers per hour. Okay, so the maximum concentration of pollutant in the cloud at uh, is at 20 times the safe level, and this takes place after one hour. Okay, so the question is, 
what is the maximum concentration expected to be when it actually reaches the town? And how long until that thing uh, reaches the town? And how long should we expect before the concentration goes down to safe levels inside the town? Well, here's the basic idea. We're going to model this thing as a diffusion problem, okay? So we can think about the pollutant as being the particles that are sort of randomly spreading throughout space. And that means that we sort of have this random probability distribution. We can say that the contaminant spread is going to be given by the solution to the diffusion equation. Okay, so let's do T, our first variable. This is going to be the time since release. of the uh, pollutant and it's going to be in hours then we'll use mu equal to the distance uh, this distance traveled by the plume center by the plume center and that's going to be in kilometers. Okay, so another piece of this, we're going to use x is equal to uh, the distance between the plume center. So distance between plume center and the town. And again, that's in kilometers. All right, lots of variables. S is equal to the plume spread. At time t, in hours. Oh, uh, sorry, in kilometers, pardon me. T is in hours, in, in kilometers. And P is equal to the pollution concentration in town and this is going to be in units times the safe level remember I told you that the initial sampling of the plume was 20 times the safe level after an hour okay now that we have all of our variables let's start putting things together okay so the first one is that we have mu is equal to 3 T. Okay, so this is the center or the distance traveled by the center of the plume. We made the, we're making an assumption here. We said that uh, the wind is blowing at three kilometers per hour. We are going to make the assumption that the wind is blowing at a constant rate. Okay, so that means that three kilometers per hour times number of hours is equal to the center of this plume. Similarly, we have that the distance between the plume and the town, therefore, is going to be 10 kilometers originally, and that gap is closing by mu, right? That's the distance that this thing is traveling at and at a constant rate. Okay, we had another piece of this, that the peak concentration, P, is 20 times the safe level uh, when t is equal to 1. And the plume spread, so the, the plume spread s is equal to 2 kilometers when t is equal to 1. Okay? So, the question is how do we put this together? How do we actually find all of the information or how do we put this into a diffusion model? Okay, well, the first thing is, is that we have a concentration profile that's going to be given by the density of that normal distribution, the solution to our diffusion equation. So we don't need to rederive the equation. What we need to do is figure out uh, what some of the parameters in this thing are. Okay, now we know that the uh, center of the plume is at three kilometers from zero or, or 
three kilometers moved after time is equal to one. And we also know that the spread of this thing is two when t is equal to one. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the spread means 95% of the contaminant, okay? So that is the mass or the, the region that contains at least 95% of the particles of this pollutant. Now what that really means is that's the center, the mean, plus or minus two standard deviations that contains 95% of the contaminant. Okay, right? That's a standard assumption. That's what, uh, what we know from the central limit theorem. So then we can say that um, the spread here is going to be 4 sigma. Now, why is that the case? Well, the spread is going over four standard deviations from two below the mean, one below the mean, up to the mean, one above the mean, and one after, or two after the mean. So the spread here is four standard deviations. And we also know that our spread is equal to two when time is equal to one. So this tells me that my sigma is equal to 0 0.5 when t is equal to 1. So that tells me that I can actually get my solution to my diffusion equation. So Cx comma t. This is going to be 1 over the square root. Now I have... Uh, sigma, so sigma squared is equal to, this implies that D is equal to sigma squared, which is 0 0.25. So I get the square root of 2 pi times D times T. Now 2 times D is 0 0.5. So I get 0 0.5 pi times time T E to the minus, and here I get x squared divided by 0.5 t. Okay, so all that I'm doing is putting in the information that I have made the assumption on, right? So this, the spread is the 95% confidence interval of where everything should, be, should belong. And using this information, I get that the standard deviation should be about 0.5 kilometers. That tells me that my diffusion coefficient is my variance. I can put all of that information in right here to get my relative concentration of the pollutant x kilometers away from the plume center at, uh, at time t. Now we know that, so p is proportional, so the amount of pollutant is proportional to its concentration. That means that there is some constant p times c of x comma t. The question is, what is that constant? Well, we know that p is equal to 20 at t equal to 1 and x equal to 0. After one hour, the center of the plume, the center, x equal to 0, is 20 times the safe level. So what this gives me is that P is equal to 20, which is equal to P naught over the square root of 0 0.5 pi T, and then E to the minus zero squared over 0 0.5, which tells me that P naught is equal to the, uh, 20 times the square root of 0 0.5 pi. And so therefore, so therefore, the pollution level at any point in time is going to be 20 times my concentration. But again, I don't care about my pollution level 
at any point in space. I care about it at the town point in space. Now, if x equal to zero is the peak, that tells me that the distance from the town is 10 minus 3t. Remember, we're moving, this plume is moving at three kilometers per hour. And that means that the pollution rate at the town is going to be 20 over the square root of t. That is after putting the p naught into, or on top of this fraction, the 0.5 pi's cancel out. And then e to the minus 10 minus 3t squared, that is at the point of the town inside of this, x equal to zero is the plume center. The point, the position of the town is x equal to 10 minus 3t. And this is divided by 0.5t. Okay, so this part might be a little bit confusing, right? It's, it's a heavy mathematics, probably the heaviest mathematics that we've, we've really worked through in this class. Um, but really the, the point is that the location of the town is at x equal to 10 minus 3t. It changes in time and that's because we are moving with the plume. X equal to zero represents the center of the plume. Be very, very careful here, right? So that means that you and I were walking with the plume. All right. So the question is, you know, what's the maximum value of P? And when, does the, when do pollution levels become unsafe in the town? Okay, so the maximum of p, which you notice now is just a function of time. So you can just do an optimization thing, right? It's an optimization problem. It's what we started with. Everything is coming full circle. Well, the maximum of this is about 10.97 at t about 3.3. And so what that tells me is that the maximum concentration of this pollutant is going to, be, at the town, is going to be about 11 times the safe level, okay? Remember, P, its units are times the safe level. It's going to be about 11 times the safe level in town after about three and a third hours, okay? Three hours, 20 minutes-ish. So you want to get out of town then because that's when it's going to be the absolute worst. Okay, and then what about when the concentration in town goes over the safe level? So we would like to solve, so if the safe level is P equal to one, we would like to know when P is equal to one. There are two solutions here for this, and one is at T equal to 2.7, and another is at T equal to 4.1. So what does this represent? This is when the pollution goes above the level for the first time, right? So this is when you increase over P equal to one. So after 2.7 hours, it becomes unsafe to be in the town. Then the pollution rises and it hits a maximum of 11 times the safe levels at 3.3 hours. And then it starts to decrease, it start, it's spreading, right? So over time, this pollution cloud is spreading out. And so it's sort of diffusing in a way that it's becoming a little bit more safe. And after about 4.1 hours, the, the pollution level goes below the safe limit. So you can actually you know, go back outside and, and live safely. So this gives us all the information that we need, right? So what we see here is that we made this relatively simple assumption that the pollution particles diffuse according to Brownian motion, which we saw is really just a Gaussian or a uh, normal distribution density. And what we did is we used all of that information to put together a, a nice model that told us when we should see these spikes in pollution and what the maximum spike should be at the town. All right, when we come back in the next video, we're going to talk about the last unit of this lecture series, and that is Markov chains. So I'll see you in the next lecture, everybody.